Please join in the first scripture reading, Psalm 130. Let us begin. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Children of God, we won't do the finger play I had planned, but the lesson this morning from the children, oh, you want to do the finger play? <laughs> the lesson this morning is that we come to church, we're doing the finger play, we come to sing and pray, we come to listen to God's word, and this morning, all I wanted the children to take home was, Jesus loves me. So will you join us in one verse of that? Or, writes Paul, <laughs> you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not also consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit. And do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Hmm. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery. Hmm. Then the hard part enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, things like this. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such things. 
And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another and envying one another. My brothers and sisters, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit need to restore such a one in with a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their loads. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Holidays are are difficult times, believe it or not, for pastors. Um, there's only so many uh, there's only so many things you can say about them, and uh, and it's always a challenge to come up with something new. Um, I try. I hope it works. Um, so you know, I've been wondering. I'm wondering, and even it was pretty pretty interesting today. A headline in in the newspaper, and the newspaper uh, was uh, again about the divisiveness, the divisiveness, the divides that are uh, being created even as we speak within within our nation, and my guess across the world across the world, and uh, it seems like the never-ending uh, litany of all the reasons why I can uh, uh, disagree with my neighbor. Um, it's just like, um, as if I needed more, I guess. I guess I did, you know. But, you know, I've often wondered, I often wonder, you know, is it better to have the right argument for the wrong reasons or the wrong argument for the right reasons? People in Galatia, let's talk about the Galatians. It's easier to talk about people who are God. Okay, so and at the height of Roman rule, mind you, the Roman Empire is just beginning to blossom throughout Europe and Asia, and uh, it's now made its way into central Turkey, where in the parlance of the empire, barbarians live. Barbarians, but they're not the kind of barbarians that ride motorcycles and cause all kinds of havoc in small Midwestern towns. No, not those barbarians. Now, overall, barbarians were pretty darn civilized. Actually, they used tools and they had laws and governments and all kinds of things. They did not have one thing, and that one thing was a working knowledge of Latin and Greek. Because, well, the Romans hadn't been there for very long. And it had only had been 300 years earlier when the Macedonian Greek general, Alexander, who liked to be called his last name, evidently, the Great. <laughs> I know people like this. Alexander the Great. He came 300 years. And so the people in Galatia have a working knowledge of Greek. They have a working knowledge of Greek, but not everybody does. And so in the parlance of the, of the empire, as it were, those, those people would have sounded something like, kind of thing. It's like when I go to like the mall or walk in a park around anywhere in Essex County or Passaic County. It's like people are like coming from all over the place and they don't speak my language. Of course, I don't speak theirs, so it's okay. But 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 barbarians got the name barbarians because of this ba 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 ness kind of thing. But evidently, there were enough people in Galatia 
who had come into a working knowledge of Greek. So when Paul got there and leaves, and then the occasion of his letter is after he leaves, he writes back to them in Greek, not English, in Greek. He wrote in, and he, you see, because the Galatians were adamant, they were adamant that they knew the right way to do things. They knew the right way to worship God, and they knew what God wanted of them. They knew, by the way, that God had very, very strict rules and regulations and laws about how you were supposed to do just about everything from eating to tying your sandals. That system of doing everything just the right way was the requirement, according to the Galatians, for their salvation. They, as I said, knew the answer. They took their position using their fancy language, Greek, and used words like, oh, sarx, pneuma, psyche, which is loosely translated flesh, spirit, soul. It's always good when you're in an argument, I've noticed, to use large vocabulary words because then people think you know what you're talking about. But remember, they had only this rudimentary knowledge of Greek, kind of like me when I went to Costa Rica and took Spanish on Rosetta. <laughs> I could ask where the bathroom was. I'm not sure what tense I was <laughs> asking for it, but I could ask. We make arguments of all kinds today without a real working vocabulary. But we know, we know the right way, which means, of course, you don't. This evidently is a good reason to absolutely other other people. Have you heard this word, to other someone? To other them. Make them be not me. So we other them. And after we other them, we put them in a silo. We put them into their own little silos so that we can divide up the world very nicely. We put them into their silo so that we don't have to talk with them or converse or to even maybe go to church with them. Hmm. Silos. You know, I know something about silos. I know something about silos because I lived in eastern Colorado for about two years. Now, eastern Colorado is not John Denver's Rocky Mountain High. <laughs> it's not that. Eastern Colorado is about as flat as the floor here. It's like, and it goes on and on and on, and along with Nebraska and Kansas and lots of places in the Midwest, they produce lots of corn and soybeans and wheat and all manner of grains. And when harvest time comes, we hope, there's a lot of it, and we store that grain in silos. Silos. I love silos. I love silos because when everything's flat, you love to have this really red, tall, brown cylindrical building and you get to see it and it's like ooh ah oh, wow this is great and it's a really wonderful for the young people in the town to climb the ladders along the sides of the silos and then get to the very tippy top and look inside but you do not want to jump into a silo you know why because not only are silos 50 100 feet tall, but most, and a half, of the silo is actually underground. Think about it. This makes sense. If you want to keep potatoes cool in the, in the summer, you put it in the basement. If you want to keep them warm, you want to put them in the basement. 
So lots of the silo is under the ground. So you got 100 feet up, you got 50 feet down, all filled with this grain. And the, due to another law, not the law that Paul's talking about, but Newton's law of gravity, if you fall into the silo or get pushed, hmm, you immediately begin to spiral into the center, and not only into the center, but you get to be pulled down and down and down and down. Young people do this for fun. Today, as we other people, we push them into silos. We push them into silos, or maybe even we voluntarily jump into our silo. You've heard that term echo chamber, right? It's when you meet a group of friends and you all begin to have a conversation and find, amazingly, that everybody agrees with you. <laughs> I like this. But it doesn't make for a nation or a world that has much to do with the kingdom of God. Paul comes to us modern Galatians arguing about who is right because we continue to argue about who's right. And he writes, remember, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, which is that word sarks, flesh, in fact. Self-indulgence is an enemy of God. Egotism, self-importance, undue pride. It's the work of flesh, remember, like sexual immorality and impurity and debauchery, things like that we can agree on. But remember, he also talks about enmity and strife and jealousy, and anger, and quarrels, and dissensions, factions, and envy as being self-indulgent, work of flesh. He reminds us of what Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's why we teach little kids, Jesus loves me, this I know. Because we got to know that. Jesus loves me. Loves me. You're going to be consumed by each other if you bow, bite and devour each other. It's like that old thing, well, you know, if you point your finger at someone, there's three poking back at you. <laughs> We need to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And I think that needs a lot of work these days. We need to really work on loving ourselves, doing kind, gentle things for ourselves. It's not selfish, self-care. Putting folks in silos is only going to create a landscape of of people who are apart from each other. You know, I do counsel with folks. I do counsel with folks who are tremend at tremendous odds with one another. They have fights that you would not believe unless you're married. <laughs> in fact, they are married. They, at one time in their lives, promised, they absolutely promised to do the right thing for each other. They promise to love, honor, and cherish each other for the rest of their lives. That's what they promise. They promise that maybe right here 
And God was a witness as well as the congregation. You wouldn't know that in my office. <laughs> Yikes! But, you know, there's ways through. There's ways through every conversation. There are ways through, and it's one of the joys of a family therapist when, when people can actually see the spirit of their partner. They can actually see. Now, I think this comes from God's grace. I think that God is at work. And there's this kind of twinkling of an eye that begins to happen. Maybe eyes well up with tears, and then hugs and tears and laughter ensues, and the spirit in the room is released. And people, people walk out with a high degree of hopefulness that they can continue this difficult task of being in relationship. Paul uses the word sarks or flesh not in reference to material bodiness. Instead, for Paul, it's a psychological aspect of an embodied, isolated soul that is opposed to the spiritual. Poor Paul, more pointedly, points out that Sark's flesh, self-indulgence, things like enmities and anger and jealousies and rivalries are against God. Angry, divisive arguments that are in and of themselves against God do not move the compass point at all towards finding the kingdom of heaven. The pneuma, or spirit, for Paul is generative, fancy schmancy word, for life-giving, life-affirming. It enlightens the soul. It enlightens the soul to seek out relationship and connection with everyone. We're all children of God. We all make mistakes. One of the most rewarding moments has been those times for me when people find their way in through the spirit to one another. Paul describes a person whose only understanding of reality is self-indulgence and egotism and self-aggrandizement as being against freedom. The hope offered in Christ includes transformation through the spirit which changes this imprisoned soul from a body of death into a body of enlightened life. It's a mystery. Paul writes about it in, to the Corinthians. He knows that it's not truly self-evident, but he does know that this love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, generosity, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are the way forward into the kingdom of God. So it works out like this in a therapy session, or maybe in your household, that one of the ways forward is to use these fruits of the Spirit. And they are fruits of Spirit. They're gifts from God. They've been given to all of us. The most powerful thing that you can do for one another is to listen. Listen. Actively listen. Not that 
I'm watching the ball game, and she's talking about something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Wait, are you talking about, are you to actively listen, which is patience? It does require patience. This is why I love the remote control, because I can pause the game. Find your smile. Try this in the grocery store. When someone is walking towards you in the grocery store, smile at them. After they've ascertained that you're pretty much crazy, they will smile back. They can't help themselves because there's things called mirror neurons in our head, and we mirror one another. Smile. Find your smile as you're in conversation with your spouse or your sister or your brother or someone who you'd find disagreement with, which is the spirit of gentleness. Be curious. Be faithful to the process. I talk to couples all the time. I say, you know, you don't have to solve every problem of the world today. You got the rest of your life. Trust the process. Faithfulness. Respect. That the other person definitely has a right to what they're thinking, which is self-control. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Eh, you might be right. I don't, maybe. Which is kindness. Accept the whole person. The whole person. They are more than being from a red state or a blue one. They are more than their political affiliation. They actually might like the Mets. That's peace. Recognize that people are doing the best they can do. Now, Brene Brown says this a lot. If you don't know who Brene, Brene Brown, B-R-E, B-R-E-N-E, Brene Brown, like the color, social worker, does a lot of really great work. She's on TV now. Brene Brown, she says, you know, remember, people are doing the best they can. She quickly adds, it's probably not good enough. <laughs> it's not. But they're doing the best they can, which is generosity. Okay. We have more to learn from each other. Forgive. I forgive you. It's one of the single most powerful sentences that you can ever say. I forgive you. This does not allow the person a ticket to heaven. It does nothing for them. I forgive you releases me, the forgiver, from having to carry around, having to carry around that resentment any longer. It's me forgiving. I do not have to be ruled by the past any longer. I don't have to carry this resentment. And it's a kind of famous saying of mine. I said resentment. You know what the definition of resentment is, don't you? Resentment is the poison that we drink expecting the other person to die. Love. That's real love. I forgive you. Find common ground. It could be about the Mets, or a great piece of music, or any piece of music that you like, or that you like the color purple, or anything. Find common ground. And this, my friends, leads to joy, which goes back to finding your smile. See, God and Jesus Christ planted the seeds for this fruit of the Spirit, but we, we need to tend them with committed practice every single day. Get out of our silos, 
stop othering people, and practice joy and peace and patience and kindness every day. Amen.